Hey everyone, today we'll be discussing obstructive pulmonary disease with a specific focus on chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and some of the implications your patient having COPD can have on your anesthetic management. As you guys probably already know, COPD is characterized by airflow limitations that are not fully reversible. The mechanisms involved usually include inflammation and fibrosis of the bronchial wall, hypertrophy of the submucosal glands and hypersecretion of mucus, and loss of elasticity in alveolar tissue. In normal lungs, oxygen flows into the lungs following its pressure gradient, which is where Boyle's Law is relevant, and as a simplified means of saying it, is exchanged across the alveolar capillary membrane with carbon dioxide, which can then be moved out of the lungs when we exhale with the help of elastic recoil fibers in the alveoli. In COPD lungs, we see bronchoconstriction and mucus secretion in the bronchi and bronchioles and decreased elasticity of the alveolar membrane. This ultimately leads to a ventilation perfusion or VQ mismatch with an intrapulmonary shunt because the alveoli are being poorly ventilated. This leaves the patient not only hypoxic but also acidotic because they're retaining CO2. Obstructive respiratory diseases including asthma, cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, and bronchiolitis in addition to COPD are determined by pulmonary function tests or PFTs. The primary thing that PFTs show in obstructive disease is resistance to airflow. The results typically show a decreased force vital capacity, which is the volume of air that can be exhaled with maximal effort after a deep inhalation, a decreased force expiratory volume in one second, which is the volume that can be forcefully exhaled in one second, decreased FEV1 to FVC ratio, and a normal to increased total lung capacity, which is often the result of air trapping. When managing the anesthesia for patients with COPD, it's important to remember that these patients are at an increased risk for pulmonary complications because of their disease state. These patients have impaired gas exchange related to VQ mismatch, increased airway resistance that results in air trapping, and increased work of breathing. And they may also have increased airway reactivity, which would place them at increased risk for bronchospasm, especially if they're actively smokers. Here are some recommendations and things to think about when providing anesthesia for a patient with COPD. First is make sure you're doing a thorough pre-op assessment. Your pre-op on these patients will help you to better understand your patient's disease severity and how it might impact your anesthesia. It can be very helpful to check out your patient's PFTs if they're available. Patients with values of less than 50% of the predicted volumes typically demonstrate dyspnea with exertion and may be at an increased risk for the need of post-op ventilation. Ask them about shortness of breath with activity and if they require oxygen at home. Auscultate for wheezes and consider pretreatment with an inhaled beta-2 agonist if they're present. Assess if the patient has had a COPD exacerbation requiring long-acting steroids in the past six months. If they have, this could result in hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis suppression and warrants consideration for stress dose steroids. It's also important to remember that the chronic hypoxia seen in these patients can lead to erythrocytosis, pulmonary hypertension, and right ventricular failure or poor pulmonale. So be sure to assess for the presence of those things in your patients. Next, you have to weigh the risks and benefits of choosing regional versus general anesthesia for your patient's specific surgical situation. Ask yourself if the procedure can be done safely without general, but also consider how certain risk factors of regional techniques might affect this patient population differently. For example, a technique that causes weakness to accessory respiratory muscles or has a risk for hemidiaphragmatic paralysis could be a poor choice for this patient population. If you end up choosing general anesthesia for your patient, you then have to decide if you're going to use an endotracheal tube or an LMA. An LMA may be a good choice for this patient population since they're less stimulating to the patient airway, but obviously there are a lot of situations in which LMA is not the safest choice for your patient. If you end up intubating your patient, you want to make sure that you're suppressing their airway reflexes in response to manipulation. Of course, there are tons of different ways to do that, whether it's using IV fentanyl or lidocaine with induction or adding in an LTA kit. Um, Whatever method you choose, just remember that this isn't a population that tolerates being light in combination with airway manipulation, so we obviously don't want to cause excessive coughing or bronchospasm. Another big thing to think about if you choose general anesthesia for your patient with COPD is this population's expiratory flow limitation and their propensity to air trap. This is further exacerbated with positive pressure ventilation. You'll often hear this referred to as dynamic hyperinflation or autopeep. This dynamic hyperinflation of the lungs can result in volume trauma, hypotension from decreased venous return, hemodynamic instability, hypercapnia, and acidosis. Some ways to mitigate this issue include allowing sufficient expiratory time by decreasing respiratory rate and or decreasing your I to E ratio, using extrinsic PEEP, 
and aggressively preventing and treating bronchospasm. Make sure you're also keeping an eye on your in tidal CO2 tracing. The more obstruction to airflow your patient has, the less plateau your curve will have. The shark fin looking tracing can be a clue for both bronchospasm and air trapping. Third, because this population is prone to rapid desaturation, it's really important to thoroughly pre-oxygenate them prior to the induction of anesthesia. Last, remember that these patients have a respiratory drive that is less responsive to CO2. So if you're looking at a CO2 response curve, that means they may have a shift to the right. This is important to remember because if you're using permissive hypercapnia to get them breathing on their own, they may need a higher CO2 before they'll pull a breath without your help. It's also helpful to remember that their arterial to end tidal CO2 gradients could be widened. So if you're in a situation where you're really concerned about their ventilation status, it may be better to check an arterial CO2. All right guys, that covered your basic pathophysiology and anesthetic management for patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. I hope it helps you guys out in the operating room. Um, if you have questions or just want to check out my resources, they are cited below and thank you guys for watching.